Perimeter Medical Imaging AI is a medical technology company driven to transform cancer surgery with ultra high resolution, real time advanced imaging tools to address areas of high unmet medical needs. I'm very pleased to welcome CEO Adrian Mendez and Perimeter board member Anantha Kinchurla to discuss the company's leading edge AI technology and medical imaging systems. Both speakers have extensive world-class experience in developing leading artificial intelligence systems at some of the world's top tech companies. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the role of AI in healthcare and specifically how Perimeter is developing its proprietary OCT imaging technology coupled with AI with the aim of improving patient outcomes and reducing healthcare costs. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. We're gonna start off with a short presentation from Adrian giving an overview of Perimeter. Adrian. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, we'll go through a few slides here to introduce you to Perimeter, introduce you to Anantha and myself. Um, just a reminder that we may make some forward-looking statements uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, and, and so to me, so I, I joined Perimeter about nine months ago um, as the chief executive officer here. Uh, after a 25 year, I've had about 25 years in technology um, down here in Silicon Valley. I started my career at a company called Cypress Semiconductor where I managed various functions. Uh, and just recently, most recently before I joined Perimeter, I was a chief operating officer at an AI hardware and solutions startup called Grok Incorporated, where I was, um, where I worked for about seven years. Um, at that company, we grew that company from, it was a startup, there were a, a handful of engineers uh, and employees there when I joined. Um, and by the time I had left earlier in 2023, we had grown that company to about 250 people. Uh, we had raised a significant amount of money. We had hit a billion dollar valuation on our latest raise, uh, and we had product and market and we're working on second generation market. And so when I was introduced to Perimeter um, with this opportunity, I was extremely excited uh, because this would be an opportunity to take what I had learned over the past seven years in the AI industry and then apply it in a brand new area in a place that's much closer to the end users uh, in a medical field, um, which allows me to take what I've learned with AI uh, and then bring it into a whole different area of, of the economy and of the industry uh, that was helpful then to a whole brand new set of users. Um, and so that's my story. And with that, let me uh, hand it over to Anantha to give a little bit of background of, of his work experience. Hi everyone! Uh, great to talk to you and uh, and uh, Adrian as, and Martin as well. So my my story starts like in India. Like I went to uh, IIT Kharagpur, where actually I worked on the last generation of AI, and uh, and when I came to the U the states to pursue further studies, I was told that AI is dead, and that was mostly because like the last wave of AI died, and we were in this what was called the AI winter, and uh, so all of us started working on alternative uh, things uh, to do what we called IA which is intelligence amplification. The idea was that people are pretty smart. So why not just build tools for them to like do a lot more with what they, uh, to make them even better. So I worked on graphics and uh, ironically, there's a connection with what I did. So I was at Microsoft, worked for many years with companies like Nvidia and AMD. So now you know what's coming. So we worked on the GPU architectures back in the day. And uh, today, like fast forward, this is really where uh, these are. This is the hardware on which like uh, AI is happening, and along the way, uh, somehow I reconnected back to the AI world. Um, first, when I was the VP of Engineering, leading the software at uh, Lyft's Level Five organization, we were building a robo taxi, which is the most uh, and hardest problem that one can solve with AI, and uh, so it was a lot of fun and a lot of learning understanding the limits of where the technology is at. That's when I really reconnected back with AI. And uh, then I went on to Meta where I led its AI platform team. Uh, so Meta has a, had a, Meta as you know, like has many products, all of which uh, use AI. And whether it is the ranking in newsfeed or whether it is like the head mounted display to do virtual and augmented reality, all of them use uh, AI and different scales. And the scale is enormous. 
And I also got to like work with people who actually invented AI back in the day, uh, back in like uh, early 2000s. And very, very recently I joined General Motors so uh, to uh, lead their ADAS organization. So ADAS is automated driving and advanced safety. So again, as you can imagine, we use every uh, high-tech AI technique possible to make driving safe and keep uh, people safe on the road. Thanks, Ananta. Okay, let me flip through our uh, about our company a little bit. So this this right here is our mission. So you know you can read it here, but you know we envision a world where patients no longer experience the emotional and physical trauma of being called back for a second surgery due to cancer left behind. Uh, so this is this is obviously um, uh, a big a big mission. Um, uh, but it's one that sort of drives the company, drives all our employees, drives our board of directors to help solve this problem. And we actually believe that we've got the technology to do that. The combination, not just of the AI, but really that overlaid on top of a somewhat novel um, imaging technology. And those two things together are what we believe is going to allow us to do this. Uh, and I think we're well on our way there. Um, so this is our mission, uh, and this is what we're working towards. This right here is a picture of, on the left side of the screen, is a picture of our product. So it's a cart device that sits inside the operating room. Uh, what you're seeing here is what is on market right now with FDA clearance. Uh, it's called the S-Series OCT device. And what this uses is a near-infrared light source that allows penetration of tissue to a couple, couple millimeter depth. Uh, but with that, what it helps surgeons do is visualize the microstructures that are within those first couple of millimeters. Um, and why that's important is uh, you can see with, with, with the OCT technology, this optical coherence tomography technology, you can see the differences between different types of tissue. Um, what's key to this technology at the OCT level is the resolution. And so as you can see right here, um, OCT with this near infrared light source has much higher resolution both, than both X-ray and MRI. And the images that you see on the right-hand screen here kind of show the, what the surgeon can see when they use OCT, which is the image on the top. Um, and then how that compares to what the pathologist sees later on, uh, which is the image on the bottom. And really the difference is that the pathology, you know, the pathology data comes back to the surgeon a week later after the patient's already gone home. Now, when we have the device in the operating room and the surgeon can see this in real time, the patient's still there. So if they observe something that looks suspicious, they can look at that and then make a clinical decision while the patient's still on the table uh, to do what they call a shave. So what I've just described is our base technology, the OCT technology. Nothing here has to do with AI, but really where the power comes in is when you can overlay um, some AI on top of that. So what, what you're seeing here on the picture on the right side is an image of our B-series device. Um, and this is what's in clinical trial right now, not FDA cleared. So we're going through the trial to get it cleared. Um, we should be finished the trial later this year. And what the AI does is it has an image recognition algorithm that reads all those images that are taken. Uh, we've trained those images. We have a database, a very, very large database, over 2 million images uh, that we've collected. Um, and so we've trained our algorithm on that. And the algorithm can go through, look at all those images and highlight those images that are most suspicious um, that there's potential for some cancer to be in the margin. That then allows a surgeon to flip through those, uh, a very small subset of images when they're looking and it helps speed up the workflow. So think of it as sort of a, you know, as a co-pilot or an assist for the surgeon uh, as they're looking through the, um, you know, everything that was scanned to be able to really look at the dozen or so highlighted, you know, most suspicious areas. And so this helps speed up time in the, in the operating room helps bring confidence to the surgeon that they're not missing something, helps improve the usability of this technology to uh, you know, many more surgeons, um, and really helps really make this device you know, 
takes it to the next level of usefulness. Um, right now, this clinical trial is ongoing. Uh, here are some of the, the, uh, you know, the hospitals that are using it. Uh, Dr. Alistair Thompson is our lead PI, uh, the lead investigator working on this. And so I think this is, um, you know, we're very excited in the company uh, for getting the results of this trial later this year. Uh, and, you know, as that trial progresses and if we're successful, you know, with what we're trying to do there, uh, this will allow us really to bring this, you know, this, this AI algorithm into the marketplace uh, and then provide it to our surgeons um, to allow them to benefit their care, you know, their patient care uh, for, the, for, the, for the patient they have coming through their operating room. Uh, and I, you know, that it, that's it for the presentation part of this section. So hopefully that gives you some understanding of what we're doing from a base technology and then the AI, how the AI is helping our customers use that technology even more. All right. Thank you. Both of you have exceptional tech and AI uh, resumes. Uh, you, you've gone out, you went over your histories, but with, with this kind of resume and this kind of market for AI, you could have chosen pretty much to go anywhere and, and to lend your expertise anywhere. What was it specifically about Perimeter that drew you to, to this company and, and this opportunity? Yeah, great question, Mark. Maybe I'll start, I'll give my answer and then I'll hand it over to Ananta. Um, for me, when I was introduced to this company, uh, I, you know, my, my first reaction to it was that I don't have a lot of experience in the medical devices space uh, and medical imaging. Um, but as I, but, but I do have uh, significant experience in the AI side, you know, of the house uh, for my last seven years at Grok. And, and really when I started at that company, AI was just starting to find its footing. Um, and so I've seen the industry develop over the last six or seven years. Uh, and through that, what I've observed is that when I started at Grok, really there were very few companies that were taking advantage of AI. And it was really the high tech companies, the Googles, Facebooks, Netflixes of the world, Microsofts. Uh, but as the technology has matured, as the hardware has become better, as the tools uh, enabling folks, engineers really to develop have become better, what I was getting more and more excited about over the years was the ability for this to get propagated beyond a small set of companies, high tech companies. And so this was already, you know, this idea of AI in other industries was already sort of on my mind. And so when I got introduced to Perimeter, uh, I was primed in that way uh, that I, I think the next phase of AI evolution is going to be able to bring this to kind of the everyday people um, outside of the tech world. And then specifically with Perimeter, what I was very attracted to was the fact that there is a, an imaging technology called OCT that Perimeter uses. Uh, that's actually in widespread usage for not for not for the application we're using, but mostly for ophthalmology and some cardio, some vascular applications. Um, but this was the opportunity to take a an uh, an imaging modality and apply it to a brand new area. Number one, number two, the company had a lot of patents around some unique applications, you know, unique ways of using OCT that allows us to really carve out a niche for ourselves that's fairly well protected. And then the third thing was the fact that the company had already built up a pretty large data library, um, a data set, uh, which for me in, in my experience is very attractive because that's actually where the value you see uh, for AI comes in. The ability to have proprietary data sets, the ability to train models, um, and then to you know, use that in a way that is very hard for other companies to replicate. Um, and I think the last thing I'll just kind of say before I hand to Ananta, was the team was very strong. So Ananta was on the board, at, you know, before I joined. Uh, I was very impressed with Ananta's resume. I looked at the team internally at the company and seen what their resumes were, what they've been capable of producing, both here and in other places. Uh, and it made me very excited about joining a world-class AI team, uh, you know, layered on top of a world-class uh, medical imaging um, team. Yeah, so I'll, go um, I'll go next. I'll go next. Yeah, I, I joined uh, 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 Perimeter like uh, maybe like nine months before Adrian did. And uh, well, you know, like I've always been fascinated by this AI thing ever since I was an undergrad a few decades ago. And the tech, the, over, in the, you know, in my early part of my career, it had just kind of faded away because 
the technology didn't live up to its uh, promise. But when it came back in early 2000s, um, early 2010s actually, uh, start using the same stuff that I was working on with um, in the interim, it just kind of felt like an absolutely natural thing for me to gravitate towards. And once I kind of started working on it, um, I, like I said, I worked on a really hard problem first, which is self-driving cars. That's where you are, you deploy every possible imaging technique and try to understand what the world looks like. And you have to use AI to like really understand what the surroundings are and what your what the machine is able to see. So, but that gave me like a view, but that was a really hard problem. But then it also gave me a view into what the modern AI is capable of. And it like very similar to Adrian, I was also thinking in terms of, oh, wow, if we can do this, what else could we be doing? And how else could it be beneficial to mankind? And there are so many different places where we could be uh, uh, employing it, like, you know, you know, like all the places where we really need help. And uh, so I was thinking about the spaces where it could be done. And, you know, like I, healthcare, climate, there's a number of different places and all of them were like very, very worthy uh, of like uh, the, to benefit from AI. So when this connection with Perimeter happened and I saw like this is something that can genuinely help uh, improve people's lives and that to people who are who badly need help it was a no-brainer for me to see okay how can I help this company how can I help them like uh, to use AI to transform so that's basically what drew me to it uh, and it did help that like uh, there were very smart people who knew, knew what they were doing this OCT thing was brand new and being familiar with like lidars and cameras from my self-driving car world it just kind of felt like oh yeah okay this is just an, yet another modality of imaging and uh, AI should easily be uh, applicable to that and it did help that they have a pretty perimeter has like a pretty good proprietary data set that uh, that could be leveraged to build uh, some pretty cutting edge applications here so that's basically why I came here to help uh, perimeter all right obviously with especially Adrian bringing on and uh, someone with your AI uh, uh, expertise into the leadership role at Perimeter, the AI image recognition is a key aspect of the company's technological path going forward. The The key benefits from AI with the imaging system, can, can you elaborate that? I guess with, as you said, the, um, you're, the, the surgeon is trying to identify when all the cancer is out of the patient so they don't have to cut out too much cancer and that they also don't have to worry about having to go back and do another surgery. So that reading of the image is very important. And so AI is being used here to augment the surgeon. So I, I guess could you the, the benefits would be A, to let the surgeon make better decisions where the AI helps them identify what is and what is not uh, uh, tumorous or, or cancerous uh, tissue in there. And then I guess to, to speed up the whole process, can you elaborate how the AI benefits the surgeon and ultimately benefits the patient most importantly? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, let, let's start with focusing on the image recognition piece of it, which we've talked mostly about. Um, if you think about, uh, sort of the situation a surgeon's in, um, it's a very high stressful situation. They need to uh, understand what's going on inside the operating room in many different dimensions. And they've got a patient, uh, you know, that's that's under on the table. So there's a lot of things vying for the patient, for the surgeon's attention. Um, so now there's this technology that helps them make sure exactly what you said. They're not cutting out too much tissue, but they are getting all of the cancer out, which is exactly what the patient wants. Um, so the easier we can make that for the, for the surgeon, the better. What the AI does, it does a couple of things. One is it gives that surgeon confidence uh, that they are seeing everything that has been imaged and paying the most attention to the parts of the image that is the most suspicious. Um, so if you think about it, you know, when you image a tumor, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of images that are being captured. Uh, from the OCT device, from our device. 
Well, if the surgeon has to look through all of them, uh, they can, they can flip through it kind of like a movie. Uh, they can flip through the whole volume, um, but it takes that amount of time to kind of concentrate and make sure that they're catching everything. Um, from their standpoint, it would be great if they had an assist saying, hey, look here, look there, look in this other place, because these are the areas which is most likely uh, to be the places that there might be some cancer in the margins. Great. What does that do for the surgeon? It takes a mental load off of them um, or reduces the mental load while they're in this in the operating room. So that's number one, makes that job easier. Number two, it helps speed up. So if you have to, if the surgeon has to go through the entire volume, uh, that's gonna take a certain amount of time. If they have to zoom in to let's say 12 images only, uh, well, that's gonna be much quicker. And for them, they're really trying to get the, you know, get the job done, get the patient closed, uh, and, then, and then send them off to recovery as quickly as possible. So these are the two main areas from an image recognition standpoint, this AI is gonna help that surgeon. Um, I think there's an element of it also, which plays to our market from a business standpoint, our market expansion, where there's going to be some surgeons that uh, are going to be more willing to adopt the technology once there is an assist, an AI assist there that's going to help them do their job a little bit more easily, get them more comfortable with it quicker. So for me, getting this next, you know, the B series, the next generation device. Uh, cleared by the FDA and onto market is going to help us with our market expansion uh, quite significantly, I think. Um, so I think that's it from the image recognition standpoint from the surgeon. Uh, there are other areas that we are using AI deeper inside the technology stack to help speed up the image capture, to help improve the clarity of the images, the quality of the images. Um, they haven't really touched on, but um, you know our AI team is kind of very active all the way up and down and through the stack. One of the areas in AI has benefited in many of its applications across industries is, and you you meant you hinted at this, is the um, skill gap reduction, where when there is an excellent radiologist or a surgeon who has a lot of skill and practice in analyzing the images, they could do a better job at it. Where if there is a newer surgeon or a surgeon who doesn't go through has the same number of surgeries to go through, this can help increase their expertise where and their confidence as well. Is that one of the sort of uh, improvements that uh, the, the AI uh, adds uh, to the, uh, the process? Absolutely. So if you think about, just take a thing about, you know, America, right? right? There's uh, many people live close to a metropolitan center uh, where there are surgeons there that do hundreds of procedures a year, hundreds of lumpectomies a year. Um, uh, there's about 8,000 surgeons that are doing at least, you know, one or two lumpectomies a year. Uh, so if you live near Dallas or San Francisco, New York, Boston, uh, you probably have access to those surgeons and those surgeons are going to be well-practiced um, and going to be top of their game. But there's also a lot of people in this country that live in more rural areas where they don't have access to those to those types of high volume surgeons. And so the surgeons that are helping those patients are not gonna have that type of volume. Um, and so part of our goal is actually to be able to bring this tool out to those lower volume surgeons that don't get the practice, um, you know, that don't, that maybe aren't getting as many, um, you know, reps, so to speak, um, in lipectomies and be able to bring these tools out to them to help them actually get the same results that uh, the high volume surgeons are getting. And so this AI really helps with that, um, where it helps allow some, a surgeon that's only doing, let's say 20, 30, 40 surgeries a year, uh, lumpectomies a year, get up to closer to the skill level in sort of assessing the margins as those surgeons are doing hundreds per year. And, and we see this as being a way to help that. And the surgeons missing some cancer within the patient isn't a rare phenomenon. There is a significant re-incision or re-operation rate. Could you dig into that and um, what potential benefits your the technology you're doing uh, can to improve that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so right now for lumpectomies, the re-excision rate um, is on the order of twenty percent. So, if you think about that, two hundred thousand lumpectomies a year in the United States, 20% of those uh, of those patients have to come back again for a re-excision. So, 
you know, if you run the math on that, it's 40,000 uh, re-excision surgeries per year um, on, um, on a situation where if, unfortunately, if the surgeon had been able to understand those margins, be able to see that in real time, that's 40,000 surgeries that would not have to happen. Um, 40,000 women that don't have to get that phone call a week later and say, you know, and hear that, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we thought we got it all out, but we didn't. Um, 40,000 phone calls surgeons don't need to make. Um, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal. Now, our goal is to try to reduce that um, and try to reduce that significantly. And so, you know, we're starting to see some very interesting results from the surgeons who have this, uh, you know, have our machines in the field. Is well, many women get a full mastectomy where the entire breast is removed for fear that uh, some of the cancerous tissue is left behind and could metastasize and, and spread to other parts of the body. Does it have a potential then to give comfort to both the surgeon and the patient that the full mastectomy is not required and that just a, a less invasive or less intrusive surgery is, is a, a, a viable and safe option? Yeah, yeah. You can imagine yourself, you know, in the situation of being a person being told that uh, you've got cancer. And the only thing you want is to make sure that you don't have cancer after, you know, after everything's said and done. And so there, you know, there is a portion of women that will say, you know what, just let's do the mastectomy. Uh, and that way we can have the highest chance of not having a recurrence. Um, now, of course, you know, if you speak to women that have gone through this, the vast majority of them actually want to preserve, um, you know, as much of their breasts as possible. And so they choose lumpectomies. Uh, but they do have to face that trade-off of 20% of the time that there is a re-excision. Um, and so that's a very, very hard decision for a woman to make. And so our goal is to try to help reduce that probability of having a re-excision to help make that decision, uh, you know, of the, of the patient and their doctor um, much easier. Um, and, and the other thing I do want to highlight, Martin, is this technology is not just applicable to breast cancer. So this isn't just women who are facing breast cancer. This technology, although we've spent so much time talking about that, uh, this same problem exists across pretty much all cancer types. So 20% is the number for lumpectomies, um, but it's in the teens uh, and higher across prostate, head and, uh, you know, head and neck cancers, um, colon cancer. So this is something that, you know, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people will face throughout their lifetime. And the goal, if we can help surgeons reduce our re-excision rates, um, it'll really help a large population, you know, portion of the population who have to face these decisions. All right. W reading the headlines of the world of AI and how it's evolved so rapidly over the past uh, 18 months since uh, uh, ChatGPT first burst onto the seems what people have learned, it's not just the algorithm, is that you have to train the algorithm with good knowledge and good information. And you referred to that you've got over 2 million images uh, to train the um, uh, your algorithms with and your, your whole tech stack with. Could you, that, that seems pretty large and impressive. Could you just elaborate a bit on that, the, the significance of that a database of knowledge, and I presume it's a growing database as you do additional surgeries where, and your algorithms improve that, the, the accuracy and the, the quality of your decision-making uh, improves. Yeah, maybe I'll just start, and I, I think Ananta probably has something to say about as well, but we've collected data through, um, you know, obviously on um, tissue types, many, many different tissue types, um, and uh, both with cancer and healthy tissue. Uh, and so when I refer to 2 million, I'm actually just referring only to the breast cancer, or sorry, the breast tissue uh, data we've collected. We've actually have more across other tissue types. Um, and those images are created multiple ways. So every time we scan, you know, every time we scan a, a tumor, uh, we actually have multiple images off of that. So that goes into the database. There are ways to augment the images that we have. Uh, so that adds to the database. And all of this just increases the intelligence of not only the algorithms we've got, but also opens up the doors for us to create even more sophisticated um, algorithms uh, without fear of overfitting uh, and, and, and things like that. So uh, it's key 
uh, to any training any type of AI. I think that's pretty common knowledge. And so we do have a very strong focus on trying to grow that database continuously. Yeah, and I want to add that like it's uh, more than just simply the image recognition work that is happening at Perimeter. Um, the, the, again, like the one that you mentioned to denoise, that's actually like a very clever and uh, pretty uh, cutting edge application of AI. So it actually uses a model called the diffusion model. And uh, so if you heard about generative AI these days, um, a uh, have you? I, I don't know if you had a chance to use something like mid journey or something like that or uh, dali like they create images so they use something called it's a technique called stable diffusion so what we use here in perimeter is very similar to that like so if, instead of like generating new images we generate clean clean images without the noise and that's basically like how like the surgeon is able to really clearly uh, see without actually like cranking up the resolution or taking double or four times the amount of time to scan. So everything that you're doing in a different part of the stacks is like very, very AI related. And you mentioned also like data augmentation. There's so many other things that are that's, uh, that are going on inside Perimeter that push beyond uh, the traditional image recognition side of AI. Yeah, and I think I'll just, you know, add to that, Martin in that this is, you know, when we talk about the attraction for me to the company, uh, and then what keeps me excited about working here is that the AI, well, both the AI team and then that we have, uh, and then we continue to grow, as well as the different ways we can use it to help the business, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of multidimensional. It isn't just an image recognition algorithm, and we've got a team to totally focus on that. Actually, the team's able to, and then they continuously do, look in the world of development, you know, AI world of what's being developed out there um, it, from an algorithmic standpoint and a technique standpoint, and then thinking super creatively about how to use that across all elements of the business. Um, so when, when, when you've got a tech, and, and I've observed this, you know, since I've been involved in AI since 2016, is you sort of, the, it's kind of this green field right now for brand new tool set AI and brand new technology continuously getting better. And what's limits, sort of what the limit is right now is the creativity of the team of how to apply these techniques and tools to various parts of the business. Um, and, and this group that was built even before I joined here and that we continue to evolve, uh, it's just very, very good at that. Um, both on the classic sort of image recognition piece of it, which is the most easily observable part of what we do, but but even you know under the hood in many many different very interesting ways, uh, like Ananta alluded to when he spoke. You've talked about the different levels within your AI stack, and you have a clear um, objective and purpose with your the current technology. But it sounds like it could be used for other sorts of images may where you're cleaning up the image and identifying it is it Im limited this technology you're developing to the oct platform or are there other modalities like x-rays or mris or i don't know whatever t other types of imaging sources that this technology could be used for as well uh yes it's, it's absolutely not limited to um to the oct you know technology imaging modality so uh and it's an interesting question uh, because if you think about it, um, you know, cancer in, in the whole, in the whole sort of, you know, treatment and di diagnosis and treatment of cancer, there's lots of different images that are taken. There's x-ray, you know, mammograms are a type of x-ray. So there's x-ray imaging, there's OCT imaging, uh, there could be different modalities, uh, um, um, ultrasound or MRI, all of these put together would make for a very interesting data set for, you know, to layer AI on top of. So what we're very, very careful of here is as we think about how we evolve the technology, not just making sure we don't back ourselves into a corner where it's really only really good for OCT, um, really making sure we've got pathways open that allow us to take different data sets uh, in various libraries and then train models that are multimodal. Um, and I think there's a lot of power you can get uh, in terms of helping surgeons, helping patients in their diagnosis and treatment, if you can pull some of this together. 
Um, and so yeah, maybe can I um, also add an analogy here? Like, so, I mean, my background is like working on autonomous vehicles. And uh, the way these vehicles work is that they use like different type of imaging technologies. They use the radar, they use LIDAR, they use cameras. And they see the same object with the, uh, these multiple different uh, modalities. And what AI does is that it can even learn if some things are easier to see in an image and, uh, um, and, and then you know it's the same thing that is seen in a radar, but in the night your camera might not be working as well. And then maybe you can identify it with the radar. So you can actually transfer the learning from one to another. And you see some similar things like when these models are able to understand uh, a structure of a language, whether it is French or German or Spanish or English, and it is able to like figure things out based on that. So this technology is incredibly powerful. So it just crosses, cuts across. It, it's trying to really understand the underlying patterns. And uh, so it's it goes deeper than just simply the imaging modality that, that is there. So the potential is like vast and uh, to be able to uh, make a multimodal system that is able to learn from one modality to another and uh, then take it back and try to interpret things in a much more deeper way. I would think also we've or many of us have seen the uh, AI generated videos now and uh, generated uh, images of cats or of whatever. And when you look at them, there's always some glitches or something you look at and say, oh, there's something a little off here. You're operating in an environment that's FDA regulated where you can't have just sort of random bad facts thrown in to your images or your analysis. So you're working with the surgeon itself. So there are sort of two sets of eyes on the image. I, I would think that developing a model under a highly regulated and a sort of limited, you're not allowed to make mistakes, so to speak, kind of like the, the car driving situation. You, you can't blow through a red light. Um, I, I would think, could you just discuss a little bit how under sort of a high high risk or a, a zero tolerance environment, how the AI process is different than if you can be sloppy in making cat imminent images or videos. Yeah, Anantha, why don't you take that? Cause you've had some experience. Across. Yeah, no, this is, this is a great question. And uh, I think this is why I'm like drawn to Perimeter because it's so many similarities with like uh, the kind of work that I do because you cannot make a mistake when you are putting a car on the road. Similarly, you should not make a mistake or cannot make a mistake in a diagnosis or healthcare. So um, it's very, very similar, but uh, I think that the way these things work is that actually in most fields, uh, AI is not yet there at a point where it is a human level, which means it cannot do like everything that a human does yet. It will maybe down the road, but that's like in the future, but today, the best way to apply AI is uh, as a co-pilot. So it is basically working hand in hand with the human and it is actually like making the people much more efficient and faster. And uh, where, where, the, where it works very well is that like people tend to lose focus and we don't have the level of energy or speed to look through a huge amount of uh, data and data sets. And uh, what AI is able to do is is able to narrow things. Uh, it can actually do those things very well. But where it can't do very well is like uh, deal with things that it has never seen before. And this is where humans are very good at. And so this combination of like putting an AI and a human together, like in the case of Perimeter, we are doing a uh, surgeon and uh, the device together, actually is, a, is the right way of doing it. And this is where like you'll see uh, the most success in applying AI. Right. Yeah, no, I think I think that's it. We're very careful about ensuring that, we, you know, part of the reason we're having such a big image library is to be able to train uh, a model up to a very high degree of, of accuracy. So the latest one, we just published a paper demonstrated over 98% accuracy. Um, and there is an element of it where you don't want it making stuff up, of course. Um, the good thing in this, in, like in our application to Anantha's point is that it operates as a co-pilot. So from a business standpoint, if we don't have a high degree of accuracy, the customers are not going to adopt it. So before it even has the ability to create a problem for a patient, 
we need to meet an even higher bar, which is the surgeons, um, or else they're not going to adopt it. And the good news is we are getting the adoption um, on the device before the AI, you know, is available on the S series. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing great market traction on that front. And uh, through the clinical trial, you know, we, we haven't seen the results of that yet, but we do know that the AI itself is up above 98%. And so when we do bring that to market, you know, upon FDA approval, um, you know, we have a high confidence it'll get adopted. Um, and if it doesn't, we'll know what we need to work on. Um, and that's sort of the quality filter, both between ourselves and the surgeon to make sure that we don't impact, you know, patient care. And I would imagine AI is new for the FDA as well. And they're trying to wrap their brains around it, how best to apply it to in, increase the skill level of the surgeon and the efficiency, which can have better outcomes and lower costs and, and greater efficiencies throughout the whole healthcare system. And, and I would think just you're on the cutting edge of this FDA approval system as well, I presume, that the knowledge you're building from that is applicable to many new modes uh, or modalities, as you've d discussed as well, and that you're creating this real knowledge base of not just the AI, but how to apply it to real world life and death, literally life and death situations. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we maintain a good... We, you know, we maintain a good relationship. We have a good relationship with the FDA, um, working through this trial especially. Um, and they're learning how to regulate technology like this. I think it's very important what they do. You know, you, it, it is brand new technology. You want to be able to bring to bear on, you know, for patient care, uh, all the best newest technology, but you don't want to do it in a way that's sloppy. Um, and so I think the FDA is doing a pretty good job balancing these two. Um, and they know what they know, and they know what we're still learning as an industry that we have to go through these cycles. Um, but like every other regulated industry with new technology, you know, we'll figure it out. Um, and, you know, we, we understand this. I think the FDA has been very, um, has, been, has, been, has been a great partner with us through this. Um, and so we'll continue working through it with them. Excellent. We've covered a lot of topics here, gentlemen. I really appreciate your time. Is there anything you want to highlight or um, emphasize or anything we missed in this discussion before we wrap things up? Actually, I want to add, uh, go back to the point that we were talking about earlier, like uh, about um, AI uh, being able to replicate the best. I think that is the attraction for me with AI. Like, so for example, like when, so the, the style of AI that uh, is used is called supervised learning. So where like we get a bunch of data and then we put experts to go and uh, label the data. Basically we use experts to train the system, the AI itself. So um, better the experts that we bring in and more time that they're able to dedicate, better the system gets. So uh, now that's the brilliance of the system. That means like you're able to like bring the best expertise to every surgery, regardless of like uh, of the experience of the surgeon. And, and this is true for like a, any application of AI where like you can collect the, the best data and you would see that in the AI world, we always talk about it as like data matters the most. So better your data, better your AI performance. And uh, so I, I actually think that this is actually like uh, really great. Like we can bring the best um, experience to the most people. And that's best for everyone. Uh, healthcare yeah. outcomes, economics, uh, so it makes the world a little bit better. So that's great. That's right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. It was fascinating. I learned a lot. Uh, it's uh, great. The innovation that AI is taking to the, to the, the world of healthcare, because sometimes some of the things that the, the big AI models are doing, not sure if that really benefits anyone, but the what you're doing is, is, is pretty clear that it can help a lot of people out there. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time. Yeah, thanks, thanks Mark. Appreciate you having us.